is due with our first baby next weekend. So I may, thank you. Now, <laughs> now I may have to cancel the class at the last minute or way early, or I may just come to the class and things happen after the class. So I don't quite know. It would be a, a, almost a medical emergency if I have to leave. So anyways, my phone is not going to be silent from now onwards. And, and yeah, if I get a call, I need to leave early or immediately. So uh, be prepared to have the class canceled at the last minute, or I'll send you a link to a video, which is my previous year's lecture to cover up for the class. So be prepared for that, OK? Yeah. So you have a question on this? If you <laughs> 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 no, I'm going to do the exam. OK. Now, yeah. will, will the exam be moved, or will you have your No, 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 student? no. No, my PhD student will come for yeah. the exam. So exam dates will not be <laughs> my exam dates will not will not be uh, moved. Uh, it will still be October eight, and my PhD student will cover up for me if I am not here. That'll cover everything from until uh, probably today or Monday next week. Okay. Cool. So until sensitivity theorem. So today we'll do the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem. Then we'll do sufficient conditions, and then we'll do sensitivity theorem. So okay. We can start now. Oh, we are already started. <laughs> OK, I'll have to spend some time erasing the first part of the lecture. <laughs> you, you want to use a piece of software called Handbrake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. OK, so we want to uh, prove the Lagrange multiplier theorem. So the theorem is x star optimal and regular implies there exists lambda star in RR such that gradient fx star plus gradient h x star uh, lambda star is equal to 0. <coughs> okay, and the problem we are trying to solve is minimize fx, x in Rn, such that hx is equal to 0. h is a function from Rn to Rr. Yeah. So this this isn't unconstrained optimization. This X is constrained. allowed to be the entire set, but right. H is describing a set of constraints. That's right. It has to lie in some lower dimensional manifold. X cannot lie in the whole space. Okay, and the way to prove this result was it's a penalty approach. It's using a penalty approach. There are other approaches as well to, to prove this result, but we will be taking the penalty approach, which is we define a function fk of x equals fx plus lambda transpose hx. No, not lambda transpose, sorry. k over 2 norm of hx square plus alpha over 2 x minus x star square. Alpha is positive, k is a natural number. And I'm going to define a set S, x in Rn such that x minus x star is less than epsilon. And I want to solve this problem, minimize x in S, fk of x. This is the setting that we covered in the previous class.
Okay. And so is K here our uh, our time step, or is it some concept that is chosen arbitrarily? So yeah, this is a okay. So this is something that uh, it's not a constant. Uh, we will we are considering a sequence of optimization problems. And we are going to look at the sequence of the optimal solutions to this optimization problems. And then we will study the properties of the sequence and prove that, in fact, xk star converges to this optimal x star under the assumption that x star is optimal and regular for the original optimization problem. OK, so what do we know so far? So the first thing we know is x star is regular which implies that gradient of h of x star in rn cross r is full rank. OK. All of you remember what gradient of h is? Gradient of h is gradient of h1, gradient of h2, gradient of hr. And we, we mentioned in the previous class that these gradients are all linearly independent at x star, uh, which is equivalent to saying that this matrix is full rank, OK, has rank r. So that's one fact we know from the assumption. The second part. Actually, let me, let me add another subpart to this first fact. This would imply that gradient of h x star transpose gradient of h at x star is invertible. Okay, so that's one fact we know. The second fact is that the set S is a bounded set. S is bounded set. And isn't that, you know, that's just sort of by definition, is it? Yes, it's, it's just bounded by X, norm of x star plus epsilon. Oh, this should be actually equal to. So note that S has less than equal to epsilon. Okay, and now I'm going to pull a result from calculus without proving. So the, I would say a lemma, which is a small result. So, so consider any sequence xk in S, which is a bounded set. Then there exists a convergent subsequence okay so there is I can define x k n that converges to some x bar so that's one thing and the second part that can be proven using the first part is, OK, let's not, well, I'm thinking whether we should prove the second part. Let's prove the second part. So if the set of limit points of a sequence is uh, has one element, has only one element, uh, 
of a bounded bounded sequence has only one element then the sequence converges to that point okay so what are the set of limit points so i had considered a sequence and i could construct millions of subsequence not millions but infinite number of subsequences from the original sequence and i can figure out whether those sequences actually converge or not okay and the set of limit points is essentially the set of all points that can be converged to by considering a subsequence of the original sequence okay so let me give you an example let's say my sequence xk is 1 if k is odd and 1 over k if k is even and then the limit limit points of xk is equal to 1 and 0 Okay. So then this sequence necessarily doesn't converge to a particular No, it doesn't converge, right? Because it has two <laughs> limit points. So this is a bounded sequence, right? It has limit points. So if I consider only the if I consider the odd subsequence, it converges to 1. I mean it's identically 1. If I consider the even subsequence, then it converges to 0. And therefore the limit points of SK is XK is 1 and 0. those are the two limit points but since the limit point has two elements the original sequence does not converge okay yes so is is point 2 saying anything more that if we have only one point we can converge to we will converge to that one point uh it does well it's a little bit more than that so what i'm saying is you have the original sequence I construct a subsequence from the original sequence. Let's say only odd, only even, or whatever, and I see that it converges to some point, and I consider another subsequence, and that also converges to the same point, and I consider another subsequence, and that converges to the same point. And then it means that the original sequence also converges to the point. So there is a bit more stronger result. It's a bit more stronger result because it's saying that you originally started with a sequence that you didn't know even converges. okay and now i am proving that it actually converges because the set of limit points is actu actually has only one element so are there, i mean are there examples then of sequences like this where <coughs> you would invoke that idea and it, it it's not just the case that all of the subsequences are actually the same uh-huh because it seems like if the, the limits why would either be the same serendipitously or they would be the same because the sequences are the same in which case we not it, it doesn't seem like we've done anything special we've just said hey i can break this sequence down into a whole bunch of subsequences that are actually exactly the same so mm, is there an example no. where they're not the same and they do converge to the same point yes i mean uh, i don't know what you mean by exactly the same but let's say i consider this sequence xk equals 1 over k it's a bounded sequence and if i consider the subsequence odd then i get the subsequence as so odd subsequence would be 1 1 over 3 1 over 5 and so on the even subsequence would be 1 sorry 1 over 2 1 over 4 and so on so they are not the same sequence They are completely different. Well, and okay, and I guess depending right. on. But if topic. you look at this sequence, it converges to zero. If you look at this sequence, it converges to zero. And so, so those aren't actually going to have the exact same sequence rule, mm -hmm. are they? 
Because you start, you would have to start at one on either case, so you would have to. But yeah, but you don't start with one here. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so, though, are we saying that at for every convergent subsequence we can make from S? As if the set of the limit points is the same, then we're guaranteed that the set x, x, xk is going to converge to that one limit point? That's right. Okay. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. Would you formally define limit point? Please. Oh, in the class? Yeah. No, I haven't defined limit points in the class, in this class. So I'm defining it here by example. <laughs> so. I said in the, so today's class, I said that limit points are the set of points. Yeah. Uh, so if you consider, if you can construct lots of subsequences from the original sequence, and you consider only those subsequences that converges, okay. and whatever that point converges to, you consider that set, and that's the set of limit points. Okay. So we don't okay. include infinity here. Uh, yeah, I don't think, because then it would be a divergent so I think you can consider infinity in the set of limit points, but I, I don't recall whether infinity is explicitly precluded from the set of limit points or not. So maybe I need to look up some, or some analysis book to see whether infinity is included or not. Uh, OK, any other question? Yes. Oh, x k n. So, so k takes k takes values in integers, right? Yeah. So I can take k n to be two n. I can define k n to be two n, in which case x k n becomes x two n, right? So this is x two, x four, x six, x eight, and so on. Right? I could also have Kn defined pretty arbitrarily. So x1, x1000, x1001, x5000, you know, a sequence, a subsequence which can be constructed like that. So Kn is just saying that, so this is a subsequence, this is a subset of the original sequence. Right? But it's not a finite subset, it's an infinite subset. So you're extracting some elements and then you're constructing a sequence out of it. But you don't change the ordering. Okay, so you don't start with x2 and then put x1. So x2 and then x5 and then x8 and so on. Okay, so I want you to uh, just remember these two facts from analysis because it's used in the proof. Uh, they are important. Uh, they are important results in analysis, but this is not a class in analysis, so you don't need to remember them for the exam. Okay, this is just being used for proving this result. Okay, any further question on this? Okay, so the first result I want to prove is claim one, limit norm of H of XK star equals to zero. Okay, how do we prove it? Well, I know that fk of xk star is less than equal to fk of x star. And fk of x star is equal to f of x star plus k over 2 
norm of hx star square plus alpha over 2 x star minus x star square. This is equal to 0. This is equal to 0. So, all we are left with is fk of x star is equal to f evaluated at x star. Oh, yeah, this is x star. On the other side, I have f of x k star plus k over 2 norm of h x k star square plus x star. Okay, so I have this inequality. Yes. Why can we say that uh, the penalty piece is equal to zero? I get that the convex implication piece is supposed to be equal to zero uh, by inspection over S, but how do we get that from this? The piece? Yes. So remember, this is x star is an optimal solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. So by definition, h of x star is equal to zero. Okay, that's why this is zero. So what do we infer from this? Okay, so I get that k over 2 h of x k star square is less than equal to f of x star minus f of x k star minus alpha over 2 x k minus x star square. And this whole term is bounded. In what sense is it bounded? We know that x, so by x k minus x star is bounded by epsilon. That's by epsilon. And we know that x star is the optimal solution. Is optimal solution, so it has some value. And since x k star is in the neighborhood of x star, uh, this will also be bounded because you can't have a function that escapes to infinity within a ball of epsilon. That's a pathological function, right? It's not a continuous <coughs> function. Okay? So, this is bounded. This is bounded because this xk star is in the vicinity of x star, so the function cannot escape to infinity. And this term is bounded by epsilon because my s is of the radius epsilon. So I have, a, I have a bounded term on this side. Let's say this is less than or equal to capital M, some large number M. And I have this term, which at least this coefficient is increasing to infinity. So this must go to 0. In the proof line at the convexification piece, you're missing the k, k on one of the x's. Convexification piece. Here? On the, the line above it. Line above, oh. Th th this one? Yeah, no, this is defined at x star, so there is no k there. Okay. This whole thing is defined at x star. Fk of x star. Then why is it in the later statements? Oh, this is this term with the negative sign, and this this is this term with the negative sign. Yes, oh, Luke, you had a question. Okay. Okay, so I just want to keep this term on this side of the equality, and this is of course greater than or equal to zero, so it's not like this term is going to negative infinity. So I have a term that's greater than or equal to zero, and that's bounded from above, and one of the coefficients is, is going to infinity. So it means that this term must be going to zero. 
right. So, this implies that norm of h x k star is going to 0. Okay. So, what do we know is this is my h of x equal to 0 and I have this sequence x k star and eventually x k star would get as close to possible to this particular surface. Okay, so that implies that x k star is in fact a solution to the original uh, problem. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so I guess all that says is that it meets the condition. Yes. Now the next point that I want to make is claim two. Where do I make it? I let me make it on that side. If x k n star converges to x bar, then x bar equals to x star. That's right. Which means that the set of limit points is has only one element, right? So first of all, we recognize that x k star is a bounded sequence because it lies within this this uh, ball, and therefore, by the first lemma, it has a convergent subsequence. Uh, it could have many convergent subsequences. I just pick one of those convergent subsequences which converges to x bar. Then it just turns out that x bar is equal to x star. So let's try and prove that. So I take the limit, so proof. I'm going to take the limit k going to infinity on this side of the equation. And then on the other side, I just have fx star. So I have f of x bar plus alpha over 2 x bar minus x star square is less than equal to f of x star. Okay. Yes. In the purple box statement, yes. specification piece, you're, mi you're missing the square. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm missing the square. Did I miss square anywhere else? No. That's the only point. Okay. So from this purple box, I take k going to infinity. I know that this term is going to 0 that I just proved in claim 1. This term is going to 0. And so xk star or xnk star is going to x bar. And this one is going to x bar. So I have fx bar plus alpha over 2 x bar minus x star square. That's less than equal to f of x star. But we said that f of x star is a minimum. That's right. Okay. Now remember that x bar, x bar, h of x bar is equal to zero. So x bar lies in this set, h of x equal to zero set, and therefore f of x bar is greater than or equal to f of x star. How do I conclude this? Well, because x bar lies in the original set, and I know that x star is a local minimum for this particular function. So I have this, and I have this. So both of them would give me alpha over 2 x bar minus x star is less than equal to fx star minus 
f x bar and less than or equal to 0. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. This one? The this step. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this. How do I get to this step? So I know that x bar satisfies h x bar equal to zero. Right. I know that x bar satis is a feasible point for this particular problem. Right. And x star is an optimal solution to this problem. So f of x star must be less than or equal to f of x bar. And what do you mean by feasible direction? Is that like Not direction, feasible point. feasible point. Feasible point means it satisfies all the constraints of this problem. Okay. And so now, hang on. The, there's an unstated assumption here, right? Because So that last line there on the left side of the vertical line, so it implies magnitude of h of x k star is equal to zero. Yes. What you're doing there is you're saying, um, that's actually a limit as k goes to infinity, right? Yes. And we just said that, oh, by the way, x bar is what xk is converging to. xkn is converging to, yeah. So therefore, that's why you're saying yes. h of x bar is equal to Yes, that's right. Because that segment is the same as this thing, right? Okay. Yes. <coughs> cool. Okay. So this one comes from here. This one comes from here. This one comes from here. Okay, a lot of uh, arrows. And then we finally get that x bar equals x star from this result. Okay, so we have proved a very important result, which is the sequence xk star actually converges to x star. So xk star converges to x star which is the optimal solution to the original problem. What about this whole land effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we are getting to it. <laughs> this is just part one of the proof, okay? And there is part two and part three. Okay. Yeah, so similar to that question, and uh, I get the statement of the theorem, and I get how you know, we proved those comments about fk of x, mm -hmm. x, but I have no understanding of why that ties into the theorem. Yeah, we'll get to it okay. pretty soon. Okay, that's the next step. So I want you to ask any question you have on these equations because I'm not going to write it again. <laughs> any, yeah? Yes. And I think in the infinity times zero would be determined. It is a thing called it through one over k. Uh huh. And then you plus the plus the k it is a constant, no no That's a good point. Okay. So he's saying that this could be going as one over k. Okay. So what I have is one over half and I just remove that particular half from here. So let me consult the book. Oh, he doesn't say anything about... I imagine that. Okay, so uh, let's try and see what's happening. So, okay, so the book doesn't say anything about this one growing slowly uh, than 1 over square root of k, in which case this might, this might be converging to some constant. So I know that I can, I can certainly make this comment, which is h of x k star is going to 0. Okay. Now, when I plug in the value of when I plug in the value of x bar here, I have f of x bar plus infinity times zero plus alpha over two x bar minus x star. Okay. Now, in analysis, typically when you have infinity times zero, you consider it as zero. Okay. Hmm. 
No. Why is that? Because <laughs> in every other case, it's undefined. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I wish he had made some comment about what happens to k multiplied by hxk. Okay, so the book doesn't make any claim about it. Yeah. So, uh, similar to that, uh, why does it even need to be a, a, the norm of H, hxk squared? Why can't it just be the norm of uh, h of x? That's a good point. Uh, and why is it k over 2? Oh, yes, I remember why it is square. Okay, uh, it is square because it will be used to construct lambda star. So it's easy to differentiate H transpose H than just norm of HX. Let me think more about this and I'll get back to you next class, okay? That's a very good point. So this could be converging to some constant, I don't know, right? Because all I'm saying is this part is bounded and this part is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. I'll get back to you on that. Okay, so until now we have this result that xk star converges to x star, so we have a convergent sequence. Now I'm going to erase this part. Any other question? Yes. This one? So I know that this term is positive and it's less than or equal to zero. How do I get this less than or equal to zero? So I get it from here. Okay, uh, so then, yeah, that's what, that's how I get that this is equal. Okay, now picture, so this is my S, this is my H of X equals to zero and my X star is here and I have a sequence which, which might behave something like this, this is my X1 star x2 star, x3 star, okay? So I have a sequence that could be at the boundary in the beginning, but then eventually it has to go inside because it's going to converge to x star, okay? In which case, let's say x20 star is, is inside the sphere <coughs> so, since xk star converts to x star, there exist k such that, or k bar, such that xk bar, or x, xk is in the set x minus x star less than epsilon over 2 for all k greater than equal to k bar. Okay, this comes from the definition of convergence that we studied at the beginning of this, this uh, course, which is if a sequence is convergent, then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a k bar such that xk minus x star is less than epsilon over two for all k greater than or equal to k bar. Okay, so that comes from the definition of convergence. And so what I have is gradient of fk xk is equal to zero xk star. is equal to zero for all k greater than equal to k bar. 
Yes. Isn't that such that uh, xk is an element of uh, xk is an element of Rn such that that condition is true? Yeah. Like xk star is always an element of Rn. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, this is a short form of writing the set. I'm just becoming lazier and lazier as class progresses. It's all that is saying is that at some point we get arbitrarily close enough yes. to x star that our, our gradient yes. becomes zero. Yes. So what I'm saying is beyond certain point, you won't be coming back to the surface of the sphere. Okay. You will always be going inside uh, of the sphere and you will remain within the neighborhood of x star. Okay, so now let's consider the gradient of fk, which is given here. So the gradient is given by Okay, so that's the gradient of fk. So I am going to multiply this whole term with I have, let me call this mk. I have mk gradient of fxk star plus k h x k star plus alpha okay and I'll pause here for a little bit Okay, so I multiply both the sides by this matrix. Now you would argue or you would ask, why is this matrix invertible? Well, because xk is in the neighborhood of x star, and since this matrix is invertible, so this matrix is also invertible. Okay, so, so the invertibility of the matrix doesn't change if you change the terms of the matrices a little bit. Okay, that's the term, that's the idea that I'm using here. Now why was it important that we did that? Oh, so I get uh, this term. On its own. Right, K of HXK star. And then I have this term. Now I know that XK star is going to, it converges to X star. So I'm going to take the limit, K going to infinity. So this term goes to zero. This term will be defined as lambda star. But why doesn't that go to zero? Didn't we say before? 
more than h of k, h of x bar is zero? Yes, h of x k, so that comes back to the other point that he mentioned. So h of x k star goes to zero, but k multiplied by h of x k star doesn't go to zero. We'll define it by lambda, lambda star. This converges to, actually, this doesn't converge to lambda star. I'm going to define lambda star that way. So lambda star equals to limit k h x k star, k going to infinity. I'm going to define it this way. And what I have is lambda star is equal to negative What happened to this x k star? No. no. So we multiply m k is, is a function of x k. Right. So yeah. Why are why are I don't see any x k stars in that answer? Why are there not any x k stars? So I took the limit k going to infinity in this equation. Okay. And we just this is defined as lambda star. Yes. This term goes to zero because x k star converges to x star. So we're 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 just doing that right there. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, okay, any question so far? On, yeah. Uh, on the third line, you have uh, the gradient of f, f, x, a star plus a times, you have the second term over there. Yes. And then you multiply that by m, k, and on the fifth line, mm -hmm. it becomes a times h, x, k. Oh, yes. So this, so the matrix transpose, matrix inverse, matrix transpose, matrix. So this is the, this matrix inverse, this multiplied by this, so it's identity, yeah. Cancels each other out. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, but now why, so that last line, the lambda star, why is it that? Right, because isn't delta, right, delta. This the gradient of f x star? Didn't we don't aren't we assuming that that is equal to zero? No, we're not. No, we are not. Right, it's not an unconstrained optimization. It's a constrained optimization. Okay. Right, so this is not equal to zero. Um, so we get lambda star. Now I'm going to substitute lambda star in this expression. Okay, and I let k go to infinity. So let's do that. That's the final step of the proof. So I'll have limit k goes to infinity, gradient fk xk star is equal to 0. This implies gradient fx star plus gradient h x star lambda star is equal to zero, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay, that's the final step of the proof. Okay, now you might wonder what's the point of this long proof. So this is typically the way optimization proofs work. Okay, I just wanted to give you a preview of how to prove things in optimization. Uh, this is of course one of the celebrated results, so we should, if you're studying optimization, we should probably have an idea about how the proof goes. 
Uh, it requires quite a bit of information from real analysis, so hopefully this would inspire you to take Math 5201 and 5202 in the future. And many students who have taken optimization have gone on to take those two courses because it's very useful in understanding some of these techniques in optimization. Okay. Uh, there is, of course, the other part of the Lagrange multiplier theorem, which talks about the second derivative, second, uh, yeah, the second, the second order necessary condition, which is d transpose the second derivative d is greater than or equal to zero for all d in v x star, and this part actually comes from looking at the second derivative. from this uh, second derivative of fk being, being uh, positive semi-definite. So you can use this result to prove the second, second order necessary conditions for optimality. Okay, so we will, we will pause here. It's 2.45 already. And then I'll take questions offline, and then we will continue our discussion on this topic on Monday. Have a good weekend. So, so, since it's positive semi-definite,